Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I am joined with Robin, a.k.a. Cubix. You are a voiceover artist. You've done uh, comic dubs on your own channel. I believe you've also collaborated on animated projects with uh, other people. You also stream regularly on Twitch. Uh, Robin, how are you doing today? Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yes, so I do uh, silly videos on my own, uh, just as a sake of continuing to make things. Um, I feel like um, being a voice actor is uh, tricky in terms of creativity, because if you're not also like an audio engineer and a comedian, it's hard to you know, like put yourself out there and share what you can do. Um, but yeah, so I like to try and make comic dubs or, you know, some kind of dubs where I can. I also, yep, stream on Twitch um, like at least two or three times a week, depending on how busy I am. Um, I've done various collaborations with animators, game developers. Um, I currently am recording an audio book for a charity called Listening Books. Um, and some of the most recent jobs I did, I was doing a voiceover for Milan Design Week, which was very silly, but very fun. Well, thank you for making the time for uh, our program, our humble little program today. Um, I know I gave you like a very brief introduction, but I, I guess, um, you know, in your own words, you, you kind of briefly touched on it, but like what kind of motivates the content and the work that you do? Um, the chance to, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard because I love doing voice work. I love having the opportunities to play characters or do narration for people. Um, so I guess the driving force for me is hoping that other people will think, wow, Robin's cool. I'll have her on one of my projects. Um, and kind of building momentum from there. Um, like recently I um, posted a new demo reel and that seemed to be received really well because really well it also included um, sort of almost reaction, live reaction from like my VTuber model um, to make it a bit more interesting. And um, that's, that's, you know, was received very well. And I already had a few people, you know, reaching out to say that they'd like me on their projects. Um, so a big motivator is thinking like, right, if I make this, someone might see it who wants to work with me. And that's exciting. Now, um, like online voice acting is kind of a very interesting field because, uh, you know, you get like people from all different backgrounds. You get some people that are pursuing this as like more of a hobby with hopes of getting into the industry. You get some people that, you know, before have like trained as an actor or, you know, went to school in acting. Um, I guess like, what is your background before you got into this whole voice acting? Was this something that you trained in professionally or is this just something that you got into because it was a passion of yours um so i don't ah, right so um i feel like when i was um younger like a maybe mid-teenager i wanted to um contribute in creative projects with people so um at the time as well whoops that was a cat sorry <laughs> at the time as well um a lot of the popular things online were uh, abridged series. Um, you know, think of like your Yu-Gi-Oh abridged or your Dragon Ball abridged. Um, one of the first thing, the very first things I um, helped out with was a. I don't think it was an abridged, but it was a, a redub of uh, the game Dissidia, you know, the Final Fantasy sort of um, crossover fighty game type thing, and someone wanted to redub it with um, you know a bunch of people. And um, I, you know, put my foot forward and I was like, yeah, go on, I'll, I'll help. I did not have a professional setup at all. The microphone I used was one that you would have used in one of the, like, singing games on the PlayStation 2 that I managed to get working on my computer somehow. Yeah, my current um, setup, basically. <laughs> I'm kidding, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the very first thing I, you know, did any acting for because I always thought I was decent at uh, acting um, and I really liked doing it but I never studied it professionally um, any any like s courses that I've done or you know qualifications that I have are in film and media studies um, voice acting was always a side hobby that I just very much enjoyed and I didn't think to really pursue it as a, a profession or put any you know uh, thought into you know a course or you know acting course or anything um, so um, the next the next thing I really got that was very lucky was um, 
um, with an animator um, who was uh, well, it's kind of infamous, I guess, or like still kind of known in certain circles, um, which is Animated James. Um, by a chance encounter, I think he added me on Twitter because he was like just starting out and adding a bunch of random people. I noticed that he was an animator and I was like, oh, hey, do you need a voice actor for anything? Um, and from there, I was in a bunch of his things and he blew up in popularity and that really helped me in cementing a lot of like an online presence in terms of just uh, the Cubix Fails brand I guess um, like even nowadays um, I'll pop into like a stream or make new friends on Discord or something and they'll be like oh oh you're that Cubix oh wow <laughs> it's just it throws me sometimes that it was such a big thing at the time that people still remember um, but yeah that that's kind of what got me into that, that was my journey into voice acting, I guess. And it, it helped that my dad was an actor or that he still is an actor. So I got a lot of tips from him in terms of delivery and, um, you know, just general acting skills. So uh, that's kind of been where it's at. And I've been slowly throughout the years building up, you know, a professional space and portfolio, trying to cement it as an actual profession, which um, I'm, I'm working on more nowadays since I've got a bit more of the resources to do that. Um, now, for some of your audience listening to this, or potentially my audience uh, too, um, what do you think is the, I guess in your opinion, what is the most common like misstep that people take when trying to pursue a career or even just pursue voice acting in general? You can do it just from impressions. <laughs> The, the amount of people I knew in like university who I would casually mention like, oh yeah, I've done some voice acting stuff. And they're like, oh, I really want to get into voice acting. I could do a sick Joker impression. And I'm just like, oh no, <laughs> you need more than that, buddy. Um, but I, I guess the misstep is like, there are for sure character actors who do amazing impressions on things, but that kind of only gets you so far in terms of like, what you can do as an actor that, that this is my personal like thoughts on it at least um but I, I do think that a lot of people who think about going into voice acting do do it because they can do a mildly good like borat or joker or yoda impression or whatever and it's it's, it's kind of just not enough you need to really think about dedicating yourself and your time and your resources into like building a setup building a portfolio and making that a thing that you really want to pursue yeah, I think the big one that I get sometimes or that I've heard too is just people that, you know, because they have like a good voice or, you know, what they classify as like a good voice, they think, oh, I should go into like voice acting because I have like a good voice or something. I mean, that's absolutely a thing um, like that I think people can pursue because if you have a unique voice that can do a, a good quality, then absolutely, maybe like you should pursue that because if you think you're bringing something unique to the table or you can at least deliver well with that voice, because if you've been blessed with a voice <laughs> that you think is a good voice, you can work on, you know, how well you can act with that voice. And that is something that people will look for. It's like, oh, I need a good narrator or voiceover or someone to play this character. And I'm looking for a specific quality because some people do or, well most people have innate qualities of their voice that they have either worked on or they just kind of have so if you have a unique quality to your voice and you can act well with that then that's something that people are going to seek out right right but first and foremost it has to be like acting you know you can't just pop in with like a good voice and like give me roles <laughs> right yeah pretty pretty much yeah it, it's 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 more than just having a good voice because, you know, you could have uh, a voice like George Decay or, you know, um, Sung Won Cho or Tom Kenny even. But if you can't act well with it, then you're not going to get very far. Now, one of the, I guess, um, well, issues I've seen sometimes, you, you briefly brought it up with like some people being like, you know, um, just character actors like, you know, they're just fit into like very specific roles. And um, is, is that something that you ever, like, worry about yourself, that you'll just get typecast into like, certain <laughs> roles without ever, you know, having to expand outside of that? 
So um, I touched on this very briefly in a, in a sort of joking sense. Um, I did an update video a few months ago, um, and I was mentioning uh, roles that I've had recently. And I was like, ah, oh, um, one of the roles I had was a non-binary alien. And I was like, ah, oh, this is cool. And the other role I had was a, a non-binary elf lady. And I was like, oh, OK. And then, the, then a reason, another role I had was a non-binary uh, typhling in a and d type setting. I'm like, oh, am I just getting typecast as like non-binary like <laughs> characters <laughs> or like feminine leaning characters? characters like this and honestly I don't really mind that as much because I think that's an interesting and good role to get um, if I'm going to be typecast in anything I'm glad it's a sort of diverse um, role like that where it's just like oh we need like a sort of like trans femme or non-binary character in our thing oh Robin's got a good voice for that she's done plenty of those before we'll have her on I'm like oh that's pretty good actually um, I guess if I was locked into that as the thing that I was known for I might be a little bit sad because I could be like oh I can do so much though I've done audiobooks I've done um, commercials I can do masculine and feminine voices so if people just wanted me for one specific voice I might feel like it's a bit you know imagine you've got like a famous restaurant and you know people really like just one dish you do but you've got all this other stuff that you can offer and it's just like okay I get that you like the pavlova but like I've got so much more to offer you know so like, I think with anyone that would be a little bit lamenting but also kind of a good problem to have like yeah in that regard fair enough yeah um I guess kind of related to that too is that I noticed some, um, well, I don't know if it's just me that necessarily notices, but because a lot of like, you know, animated media that I watch is, you know, it, like English dubs of like Japanese animation. And I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes with a lot of those performances, either due to, you know, like the nature of the dubbing industry, the fact that you have to like crank out so many of these in a year, is that with these performances, sometimes I feel like. I, I guess the best way I would explain it is that you kind of get into like a default mode of doing certain performances like oh if you have like a really intense scene I have to do this voice with this cadence and whatever and um, I, I guess for you and I, again I apologize if this is too like uh, esoteric of a question or whatever but um, I guess for your own performances how, how do you think you would avoid that type of like you know default for like performance in, in a sense like going to like certain defaults for certain like emotions or scenes or whatever I mean, a lot of it with acting is like doing what you know. Um, well, I say, I say what you know. Hey, Mia, sorry, I got my cat. She's very noisy. Um, I suppose the the way of avoiding that, I guess, if you want to avoid that, because sometimes p people do c acting in a certain way that is very good and people want that. But I suppose avoiding um, falling into the same pit traps of what you always usually do is, you know, what directors are for a lot of the time um, or like a lot of the time when I do auditions, I will have my um, friend Cassie, um, who is an audio engineer, uh, I'll have her in call in Discord and she will sort of direct me through the audition and give me feedback there and then, um, which I think is actually quite an indispensable thing. If you're going to be doing voice acting and you know, you're doing auditions, have someone in a call with you, give them, have them give you feedback so that they can let you know where they think you can improve. Um, like even if it's someone who's not particularly well versed in you know, um, acting or, you know, audio direction, uh, anyone's opinion can be valuable if you feel like you might be falling into the same pit traps. And if it's someone that you consistently have on, they will notice these things. Um, so I think, I think my best way to, you know, avoid falling into those same things that you keep doing or avoiding the like similar ways in which you may act things is to just have someone there to give you live, you know, feedback on that. Kind of keep on topic with the whole like uh, anime dubbing scene. I, I briefly talked about this, I think, with uh, another one of my guests because, uh, like, he he was he's also part of like the whole abridged scene. I think uh, he does like his own abridged series, like with the Persona series. And right. one of the points that we brought up was the fact that, um, you know, with like the modern like voice acting uh, or dubbing scene, it kind of feels like. He, the the only way to like really break through in terms of like working with the larger companies is if you've either been in the industry for like years or if you um have if you like first build a platform um like on YouTube or something and then break out into voice acting like you saw with like Ego Raptor or Pro Z 
Prozidi, Prozidi yeah, that that's yeah. Sungwon Cho. He's he's great. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I guess does that does that discourage you at, at all? Like you know, it's, like, yeah, yeah. It, it it makes me think of one of the things I was thinking about recently. Like to, oh my god, to be successful in um you know a professional field such as voice acting, you need to have time, money, and resources, or like connections at least. Um, and I I feel like at various different points I've had such varying degrees of each of those things but never quite enough of what I've needed you know if I was out of work I've not, not got enough money to invest into good kit um, if I'm working I don't have enough time to look for auditions uh, if you know I'm doing other things I don't have the energy to do it or um, it's, it's tricky so I, I think certainly a lot of people do get lucky. I, I say lucky in that regard, but they do get noticed. So, you know, you, you see with your pros EDs who like do make a lot of things, but I know he had been doing voice work for a long time. I commissioned him um, years back when, before he had really been like big and discovered and, you know, I did a quick voice acting commission. Oh, he did a quick commission for me for one of my videos back in the day. Um, and to see that he has come so far from, you know, asking on Tumblr for like random voice commissions, he's in like Netflix series now, is amazing. But it also feels like you've got to look at their journey and see what they've had and what resources they've had in order to develop that. Um, so, yeah, it, it can be hard, you know, especially if you like you are making things online and you do have a portfolio, you could be doing everything right. But if you don't have the right connections and if people don't notice you, no one's going to hire you. And th that is discouraging. But... I feel like the more I do this, the more people I meet. Like only a few days ago, like I met more people who are in like the animation industry and they're, they're working on things like Hell of a Bus and, you know, Has Been Hotel. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a good, you know, person to know in case they hear that, you know, people might be looking for voices and there might be a casting call that they could like discreetly push my way. Um, so, yeah, a lot of it is just knowing people. Um, but that's why it's always good to try and get to know people. Um, you, it, it's self-destructive to stay in your own bubble um, and expect everyone to come to you when you know you could be also looking at other voice actors and seeing what they're doing and making friends with them and then collaborating and then you know working on your skills together so it's it's definitely a collaborative field you can't really do it on your own so given the current state of like anime animated projects or anything is there, are there any like dream projects that you want to work on that are might potentially be coming out in the future that'd be like oh that's, that seems pretty cool to do oh i'm smiling so hard right now because me and my partner have been joking and me and my friends have even been joking about it um so there's an older anime called run the one half which i'm a huge fan of um it's kind of dated but it's the rumiko takahashi work which is the same person who or same author who did uh inuyasha and uh yatsura something i forget how you say it um but that is one like one of my biggest favorite animes and um, they announced recently that they are doing um or like making a new anime series or they're at least there's some kind of like tangentially ranma related news and um that if i could get into that that would be like ridiculous and absurd and a dream role um because it is um sort of trans allegory no trans themed i guess because the main character switches from male to female like for by weird means um and i feel like it would be interesting to or very fun to get a role on that because and um, there's a lot of topics that could be touched upon with a modern lens um but yeah, that, that's that, that's my sort of like dream gig um if i could get into a run a related media of any kind um other than that maybe something ace attorney related because that's always been a, a big uh, uh you know, a big series that I've loved as well. Or any fighting game. Okay, that's my top three. <laughs> any fighting game, Ace Attorney or Ranma. Well, uh, being a fan of fighting games myself, uh, any any series in particular? Oh, okay, if they somehow make another Marvel versus Capcom, oh. if I could get into that, that would be just, like, ridiculous. Like, just just before, actually, we were, um, me and my friend were setting up for our stream that we've got tomorrow morning, and I loaded up the Capcom fighting collection. I was like, oh, this is dope. Um, I want to play this. And I was on the menu, and I heard, like, the announcer going, like, Street Fighter 2, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, cool. Wait a minute. I know that voice. <laughs> That's the Honest Trailers guy. What the heck is he doing here? So it's cool to see that he's got, like, a lot of professional stuff going on because he has a very cool, like, you know, that epic voice. Um, and 
you know, it's cool to see him getting things. And it's, it is almost like inspiring to see people in like scenes or like from just YouTube, you know, that are now getting like professional work in like actual games and animes and stuff. And it, it's, it's really cool to see. Um, but yeah, that, <laughs> those are, those are my like big ones, I guess. Yeah, it's funny how you brought up the Marvel vs. Capcom 4 because uh, my I think it was like my my previous episode before this was um, me actually arguing that I don't think they're going to go with Marvel vs. Capcom 4 or another Marvel vs. Capcom game, like, period. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one because um, a lot of companies have specific game developers who make games for them, um, and we're kind of not really in the days of Marvel and Capcom anymore. Marvel have other studios who make games for them. A lot of the reason that you know Marvel vs. Capcom happened at all was because Capcom made Marvel games back in the day, and they just had a lot of the assets that they could kind of put together. It's like, oh, hey, we've got the Marvel characters, we've got the Capcom characters from all their in games, let's put them together. And it feels like it's really stretching the concepts if we were to make a Marvel fork, because Capcom just isn't as relevant to Marvel anymore, especially with how big Marvel is nowadays. They've got so many other games that they're making. Um, so it's, it's kind of depressing that, you know, we probably won't get another one, but I, I would hope maybe at least that Capcom would make their own big crossover fighting game with all of their properties, because Capcom has got, like, so much that they could pull from. Um, like, if you just had a fighting game that is just a Capcom fighting game, the insane roster. You, you could have so much fun crossover potential there like another uh capcom fighting jam basically i guess so uh yeah like i would just like to see all the capcom like because when i play marvel versus capcom i only ever play as the capcom characters anyway <laughs> like the marvel characters for me are just like a, oh yes i can beat up the hulk with phoenix right how dope um but yeah i i would like to see that in future i think yeah my logic with it was that uh I just don't think we like kind of exist in the industry space for like you know the the full commitment to these like large scale crossover projects. You know, like when, yeah. when we see when we see crossovers, it's usually in the form of like DLC as a means of like promoting already existing. Yeah, you know. But games. do you think you're like your Fortnites and your stuff, where it's just like, whoa, Magneto is in the new Battle Pass, and John Wick is there as well as you know <laughs> Eminem, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's crossovers. I think have always been kind of like not shock value as such, but sort of a bit of a novelty. Um, but I feel like a lot of the time people don't really get what makes a good fun crossover. Um, like, I think um, Lythero posted recently about it, about how one of his favorite things about crossovers is the characters actually interacting, and doing things together, and you see how the worlds interact. Um, and I feel like a lot of games kind of miss that and don't actually really have the interactions. Like, um, with Smash Ultimate, the most recent Smash game, there's, like, very little character interaction. Like, you don't really see them actually interact in interesting ways. It is sort of just, like, a toy box situation where they're smashing heads. Like, the most you get is in, like, the, the Metal Gear codec calls and Pitt's um, Palatina's Guidance, where they actually talk about the characters. And that 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 is, like, ooh, yes, good stuff. I want more of that. But they, they don't do it as much in, in uh, crossovers, I feel. Now, this is usually a question I like to ask people that in general work, you know, with their voice, um, because I used to do like uh, myself, like longer form, like solo episodes on the podcast. Mm. Uh, and so so what do you do like after voice recording session? Like what's your go to way to like kind of relax your like voice after a hard day's work, basically? Uh, not use it. <laughs> um, I mean, so my, my job, my, my day job is, um, talking on phones all day, which is kind of a blessing and a curse because it helps me warm up my voice throughout the day. It's like, Hey, I'm using it. I'm doing things with it. Um, but I would say more, the, the prep for me is more before recording. So if I know I have a big intense recording session coming up where I have to either scream or sing or do a really kind of like chesty gravelly voice that I might not be, you know, as used to doing, um, the go-tos for me are, um, so I used to do um, speech therapy, um, which helped me, you know, get my voice to where I wanted it to be. And uh, one of the things I used to do a lot for that was singing uh, Smash Mouth All Star, which is a very good speech therapy <laughs> song because it 
is a flowing song that slowly gets higher as you're singing it. So it starts more, um, not monotone as such, but it stays consistent. And then it goes higher and higher and higher and higher, back to low, higher and higher. So that I feel is a very good warm up song. So I will sing that sometimes and then change the key if I feel like it's too easy now. Um, and then also um, another good uh, vocal warm up is to just hold a note for a long time. Um, and go through a scale. So for me, it would be like, nu, 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 and just hold those for as long as you can or as long as you have breath, because that really helps warm up your voice. Um, also, I like to have a lot of tea. Um, my go-to drink for before recording is um, tea with honey and sugar and a little bit of almond milk. Although my friends have said to cut out all the sugar because it's not great for the vocal quality, apparently. So I might just um, stick to having just a mug of boiled water, which would be the best technically for your voice, I guess, um, in terms of like the specifically best quality. Um, so for me, yeah, I'll um, do vocal warm-ups, have a nice hot drink on hand, uh, hot drinks are really good for keeping your voice loose uh, and then afterwards um, I, yeah afterwards if it's been intense I just rest just rest the voice do not use it um, and if you do need to use it very speak very softly and try not to push yourself too hard now I, I've gotten mixed responses from this one and I, I guess kind of as a related question uh, what are your thoughts on using like throat lozenges because I like Ricola and I used to use Ricola like a lot when I, we do like the longer episodes, but uh, I've heard like mixed things. Like some people just don't don't really like it. I think part of it is because of like the the little like whole sweetness aspect, like you said. Uh, but I guess what are your thoughts? Uh, I don't really use them. Um, if I'm honest, um, I've only ever used I think lozenges to soothe my th throat if I've got like a really bad sore throat or something. Um, but in terms of like for just voice keeping your voice healthy um i don't know i can't see it as a thing that's very good to do for your voice um one of my cheats probably is like eating a green apple because like <laughs> that that's kind of acidic and helps get rid of some of the phlegm in your throat maybe but um no i i, I can't say i've ever used a, a lozenge for the for the sake of you know before recordings to keep the quality up or anything mm, yeah i've never heard of that tray i do like green apples a lot like ever since i was like a a kid they are top tier know. apples. They they are very good. <laughs> um, well, God, I always forget to ask a guest this. Uh, I don't know how much time you you had with me. Uh, I guess I should ask that before I uh, before I continue. No, I've got as much time as you like to have me for. I'm I'm free for the evening, so it's fine. Okay. Okay. Well, we're like usually it lasts about an hour. We're at like the halfway point. Um. Yeah. Being realistic, like, I don't know how much of your audience is going to listen to this. I mean, we have very different, you know, voiceover artist, boring podcast guy. You ah, know, don't be so hard on yourself. God, doesn't feel, <laughs> but the, the point is, like, you know, as kind of like a little Easter egg for your, your audience, you know, as like a little treat if they make it this far into the episode. <laughs> and if you have, thank you for listening. Yeah, um, wow. Yeah, do you have like like anything that you would like to talk about as like you don't think would normally come up when your usual content that you think would be interesting to talk about here? Oh gosh, I can't. Um <laughs> I can't think of much. Um I don't know, because when, when I'm like streaming, I will just talk about whatever comes to my head um or whatever's going on in my life at the moment. Um I mean I don't oh, I don't know. You could also use like, it to just rant about or, you know, like complain about some aspect of voice acting that, you know, you don't feel like it's voiced enough. Like, go ahead. Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. I guarantee you. I'm I've sure seen my analytics. My retention is like 0.1. You're good. Go ahead. It's okay. I mean, there's no, there's nothing I can think of that is particularly irking me at the moment. I suppose, well, maybe. So recently I've been trying my best to get over the feeling of sort of envy towards people that I know or like other professionals in the field. And it's like something that I don't feel like it's talked about that much, um, like in a public space where you say something like, oh, heck, I'm seeing so many people get so many cool roles. Oh, woe is me uh, that I cannot land a single one. Uh, alas. But like, that's just your inner monologue. It's 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 like a self-defeating thing like for the, for the longest time I, I had a friend who um, was a professional voice or is still a professional voice actor and they're doing really well and I would consciously like block them in my head every time they came up because 
whenever they did come up and I could see that they were being successful and doing really well, it felt like almost like I had failed myself and the expectations of myself because I thought, well, if they can get roles, why am I not getting roles? Because I feel like in my head I'm, I'm as good, if not better than them. And it's like a prideful thing that you need to sort of swallow and you know, the, the, your gut reaction is like, oh, ignore them, you know, we're better than them. But what you should do is congratulate and interact and be like, oh, wow, I knew you could do it. Well done. Even if like your inner monologue is like being a grouchy like <laughs> child throwing a strop, you've got to you've got to try your best to push past that. Um, but that that's my biggest problem, I feel, that is like most self-defeating, where it's just like, ah, yes, I, I am being so jealous and bitter and envious about all these people who are doing so well when I should be seeing it as an inspiration and you know cheering them on um but that's that's my mini rant of just like my own self-defeatism <laughs> oh fair enough i i also get that too a lot especially if i'm like on social media a lot i, I tend to feel that because uh especially with the recent change to uh, twitter x whatever you want to call it it's twitter no i don't think anyone's gonna call yeah, it x because that's stupid <laughs> it's so stupid no one's gonna call it that it's twitter no such a such a marketing nightmare um but like uh with like the recent change where like likes are privated uh, i i made like a post about this but um I, I was kind of mixed on it because on one hand yeah that's like a really stupid thing like bookmarks are like useless right but yeah um, on the other hand it, it also came with like the update um where you know because like my my for you tab has been like vastly improved like if people like i actually kind of want to like follow and engage yeah. with um but because of that i'm getting like a lot of like extremely talented people because you know i follow a lot of like streamers and like you know i like content mm -hmm. from like streamers and stuff like that and it's like yeah people that are like blowing me out of the water and it's just like <laughs> ah get it i know I got it, it's, it. A, it's a very hard feeling to overcome sometimes that that envy um i think a lot of the reason i stopped going on the for you tab of twitter was because i would constantly see the same people posting things and just get immediately envious about how well they were doing um so i'd go on the for you tab to see a lot of smaller artists or smaller people um and you know i'd feel better about myself <laughs> but I think a lot of it is remembering that a lot of people curate their online presence to the best that they can offer, or they have a lot of free time to do things, or they've just built up a following for over how, however long. Um, and it's, it's hard to see that side of it, I guess. So I take it from our, from our conversation and it's just, it's just a wild guess here, but I'm assuming that you are a fan of anime, right? I, I, I partake in the in the Japanimation run now and then. Yeah, I mean, now it's a running joke on the show that like I'm apparently like this huge anime fan, even though I'm not. I swear I'm not, but it's like everyone that like I pull into this sphere happens to like anime. I don't know if it's just a me thing or something. I don't know. But, um, it's a popular thing. It's it's like finding someone who just doesn't like cartoons, you know, or whatever. It's, it's it's an entire medium that has so much to offer. So if you find someone who doesn't like any animes at all, that's I don't know. I feel like that's that's more impressive. But what, okay, so what would you say like because you know the show is about like talking about media or whatever. Um, what is your favorite anime? Um, so I mentioned it earlier, one of my favorites is uh, Ranma One Half, which is, I, I would not say it is a good anime, but it is one of my, fa it is like my all time favorite. Um, it's, to give it a quick rundown, it is like rom-com mixed martial arts shonen protag, you know, um, it does not take itself very seriously. It has a lot of silly themes, um, but it has some really fun arcs and jokes and animation, and uh, I really enjoy it. Um, I think another one of my big favorites, uh, jo JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, that's a classic. Um, it's, um, I'm trying to think, like some other like lesser known ones maybe that I really like. Oh, um, there's one called uh, Final Fantasy Unlimited, which is an adapted, well, it's like a Final Fantasy type anime, um, but it's not based on any of the games. It is its own story within the Final Fantasy sort of mythos. Um, and it takes some elements from the games and it makes zero sense, but that's kind of why I love it. Um, like I showed my partner it because um, I was like, oh, we should watch this anime. I remember it being really silly. And at the time, I don't think it made 
any sense. But surely we, as adults who have media comprehension, can understand what it means. And when we finished watching the anime, and it's only like maybe 15 episodes, um, you know, the credits rolled of the final episode, and she was just like, Robin, none of that made sense. No questions were answered. Nothing happened. Like, nothing. Oh, it, it was just insanely. I, I, I was going to say, like, random. It's not like random. It's just that they don't explain a lot of things and they expect you to kind of. Um, I don't know, read into it yourself, I guess. Um, but I, I would recommend that for anyone who's looking for a really weird anime. Um, and I was going to say, like, maybe a third one uh, that is, like, a, another classic that I liked. Um, oh, uh, Trigun. Trigun's great. Um, I know they remade it recently, but I've not seen that. Um, but the classic Trigun is really good. I remember that being a lot of fun. Yeah, I've seen a bit of, like, the, the new Trigun. Um, and it, it's decent. The only thing is... Um... God, I don't know how how to explain this problem, but I feel like they went like too bouncy with the animation. Like, uh, the example I would give is like the there was a recent game that came out like ZZZ, where it's like it's good animation, but it's like too movie, you know? Like, oh, is that the one with the character with like the mask who sounds insane and is really wibbly looking? I think I think I've seen. I think I know the one you mean. Um, yeah, it's like really exaggerated animation, and I kind of love that in in parts because it can be really fun. But I, I understand how that's not a lot of people's cup of tea. Yeah, I mean it's like, it's like a give take thing. I don't know, like especially with like how a lot of animation has like kind of improved over the years and stuff. I think you you know, and I I guess I always like sometimes when people are more subtle with it. But that, that's just me. Not to say that you're right. Uh, not to say that it looks bad. Like oh, no, of course it it's, it's it's just, subject just a to bit taste. Much. Yeah. Um, I guess for, uh, kind of going back to like the whole, like, you know, you you being a fan of anime, um, what, what company do you think does like the best job in terms of like, you know, translating over like, you know, you know, into like English doves? Like what, what do you think is the best like dubbing company in the, in the game right now? Uh, um, it's hard to say. Uh, one, because I'm not massively familiar with a lot of the dubbing companies. Um, I know that a lot of the ones that do the Netflix dubs, a lot of them are great. Um, they seem to put a lot of effort into actually making them, you know, come across really well uh, from a translation perspective. Like, two of the ones that I've seen recently, um, when I've been watching the dub, um, two, two of which actually feature um, Pro ZD, because um, he's in both of those. Um, there was Pluto, which is an adaptation of a... Um, Astro Boy story, which is like a murder mystery about like uh, the the world's strongest robots just getting murked, um, and then there's obviously Dungeon Meshi, or oh, sorry, Delicious in Dungeon, um, which is also really done fantastically. Um, so I, I'm not sure like if Netflix do their own dubbing. I think they do, um, but I think Netflix has done a pretty good job of like pretty faithfully uh, translating a lot of animes over for the West. Um, but I can't really think of many that I've seen recently that have been really bad. Um, but then I'm, I don't watch a huge amount of like new animes and pay attention to who specifically is doing the dubbing. Yeah, the Netflix dubbing is weird though because like you're right, like with a lot of the like anime shows in general, I, I think they're like really strong dubbing. But then you get into like any time they have to dub like a live action show and it's just utter trash. And I, I don't know what's going on over there, like. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. No. It, yeah. Yeah. It's 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 a strange one. I think with live action shows, it's almost less. Uh, you, you have to be more specific about it because animation. There's a degree of, you know, interpreting how a character should act or sound. But with live action, it's it is what you see. Um, like I think the one of the most well one of the only shows I watched with uh, subtitle well dubbed was um there was like a korean show about like an autistic lawyer and i really liked the first episode of that but the dub did throw me off a bit um it, it was a little bit distracting um that it, it just didn't really match that well i don't feel like um so yeah there, there is a weird sort of like not discrepancy as such but like jumping quality from like and say an anime dub and then a live action dub um so i think um because you know, some, I, sometimes I uh, I think I got some of your posts on my uh, Twitter feed or whatever, and um, I, I saw that you were doing something with like Frankenstein. Like, is that like live action? Uh, 
live action acting oh god oh wow yeah so um i do i do amateur dramatics as well um that's more of a i, th- I say volunteer it is technically a volunteer thing um so where i am there's like an amateur dramatic uh, little theater and um one of the first gigs i got there uh was uh, a role in the production of frankenstein uh it was a very small role i just played a maid <laughs> like the clarice the maid she did originally have actually a bigger role um but she was cut down a lot for that specific production um which was a good sort of like foray into uh, theater acting and stage acting because I'd never really done it properly apart from like, you know, maybe primary school, but even or like, <laughs> yeah, but even then it's just like, you know, nippativity, you don't really get to like flex your acting chops. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like doing stage acting has really helped me in, um, you know, being a better actor because, you know, you're working with people, you're collaborating and you're doing um, a, f- a fun show and um, you want to make it the best it can be so people will let you know how to improve and you've got live directing there most sessions as well where they're like, oh, can you do it like this? It's really good the way you did that, but can you do it like this? And you're like, oh, okay, that's an interesting take. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I do find it a little funny because uh, the first production I did was, you know, Frankenstein, Clues the Maid. Second production I did was um, Black Coffee, which was Agatha Christie's first stage play that she wrote. Uh, and that's with, you know, the famous detective Poirot. Uh, and I got to play uh, Captain Hastings, which is like Poirot's, you know, um, buddy. <laughs> his, um, like, his, his uh, Watson to Holmes, I guess. Uh, and that was interesting because people who had seen me as Clarice didn't clock me that I was playing Hastings and when I told them that I played those two roles they were like oh whoa that's that's quite the the parallel quite the, the, the two completely different roles um and then most recently we um did a production of uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream so Shakespeare play and I got to play uh Helena who is one of the lovers in that play and um I remember at the time I was thinking like wow I've got like lots of big chunky dialogue it's um it's a lot to remember and one of my co- co-stars basically said oh yeah well helena has like one of the most lines in the play and i'm like no that's that can't be right no what um because it's a production of like 20 odd people and um he was saying like oh yeah no like helena's got like the third biggest part in the play she's got like a lot of big lines i'm like oh heck this is gonna be this is gonna be uh <laughs> really difficult and it was i had to take a week off work because I just didn't have the time when I was working to actually learn all my lines. And there was like literally like pages and pages of just paragraphs of dialogue that I had to remember and also understand because Shakespeare can be quite hard to to get really. So even like a week before the production went live, I was thinking like, oh, I kind of only just understand what he meant when he wrote this line. And now I know how to actually act that properly. Um, so, so yeah, I do, I do some amateur dramatic stage stuff as well. That's, that, that's the, that's the point of that tangent. Um, so for you, I guess, what are like the notable, like, I guess, differences in your approach to how you do like a voice acting job versus how you do like live action acting? Like, God, it's I interesting can't because keep calling it live action acting. That's like so <laughs> weird to say. Theater work, I guess you could call it, or like theater acting, or yeah, there you go, yeah, stage acting. Um, you know, that would be the more apt one, I guess. So, um, yeah, like with with voice acting, it's like way more insular. Um, so like I am in my tiny booth, which I constructed out of a little closet. And I have a script on my phone and I've got to like keep an eye on levels and stuff. And that's like a kind of thing in the back of my head to make sure, you know, it sounds good while I am recording. Um, And a lot of the time when you're doing auditions, you don't have a lot of context for what you're saying. It'll be like three lines and one of them will be like, oh, I pick this one or, ah, yes, you've swayed my daughter. Screw you. Um, Or, you know, something. And they don't give you context a lot of the time for how the character should actually be feeling some of them do which is great um but even then with just like um, a line of context it's not necessarily enough to know what they're looking for in that specific space um so it can feel like you're kind of shooting in the dark in terms of looking for what people want um and also how you approach that as well so you can you can give an emotional performance but if that's not what they're looking for then that's tricky um but also you know there 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 are times where i'm doing a live recording session and i'll do my bit and then they'll give me feedback and that in in a sense is kind of similar to stage acting because with doing stage acting you know you you run the scene or you run a part of the scene and then you kind of look to the director to see 
what they think and if anything can be changed and if anything needs to be changed immediately they will just stop you and say hey hey, hey whoa, whoa, that that part you did there can you just do it this way um and you know because you're also doing it with other actors most of the time it does feel a bit more real a bit more like collaborative um and you get to play off other people and their performances but you know with voice acting it's very rare i feel that you know, you can do a session of voice acting recording and play off other actors there and then. Um, things are often, most often, especially with indie animation, recorded separately. Um, so you're not going to get the natural, you know, sort of flowing dialogue that you might get in a stage production or in a, you know, uh, a production um, with voice work wherein they have had all the voice actors in one recording session. Um, so I guess that, that to me is probably the biggest difference wherein you don't actually know how your co-stars i guess are going to be reading their lines so you don't know how to appropriately bounce off them uh, in terms of you know online voice work now i, I don't want to assume the answer to this but uh is there one that you prefer over the other like in terms of, styles um, of I, I feel like i much prefer voice work um because well, with with stage shows, like because it is like a sort of volunteer thing, I do that more to hone my skills and meet people and, you know, collaborate and have a fun time in town doing a play. Um, and then it means I get to invite friends over and all this stuff. So in that regard, I like it in that. I like doing it for that. But I wouldn't pursue it as the thing I want to do consistently. Because, um, you know, when I am rehearsing, I have to drive down. Um, I've got to, you know, make time in my evenings to make sure I can, you know, do rehearsals and then do the play. And when we're doing the play, it's for, for a full solid week that you do production every night. So that's six days, technically seven, because um, the day before we go live, we always do a full run through uh, the day before. Um, so that is a lot more stress, I feel, um, than just doing voice work. Because I love doing voice work because it's like I can find uh, a bunch of you know, casting calls that people have sent me, I can record them, send them out, add them out, and then I'm done. And then if I get a role, that's like a nice, exciting bonus. Um, but in, if, if I don't, I get to, you know, hone my skills again with like um, audio editing or, you know, recording space and all that. Um, so in terms of preferring something, I'd probably prefer um, voice work because then also I get to see my work in you know either a game or a cartoon that i think is going to be really cool and that to me is just an amazing feeling to know that you've helped contribute to something like that now um for for yourself uh because i, I mean i don't know how much this is like an issue for um I, I think like for you know singers and voice actors and stuff like that like you know if you ever go to like a social setting are you do you ever have like situations where you're pressured into doing it like a party trick you know like oh do this yeah. voice or do that voice um yeah there's, there's been a few situations in which i will you know people will ask what i do or what i like doing and i'll mention voice work and you know i i do um volunteer training or volunteering for um a, a charity wherein we go around schools talking about lgbt stuff and uh, one of the fun facts facts I have is that I, you know, do professional voice work. And a lot of the time the kids will ask for very specific impressions, like either Shrek or Kermit the Frog or Mickey Mouse. And it's just like, okay, well, like, I can try, but like, that's not what I do. I'm not, I'm not like an impressionist. Uh, like, I, I think I've got a pretty good range. Like, that's one of the biggest things I have going for me, I feel. But even then, like, when people ask me to do a specific impression, unless it's one that I'm, I already feel like I can do pretty well uh, it, just, it just feels very awkward because then it's just like oh, i'll do this voice i'm like oh um uh here you go and then like oh that was okay and then, then, then it just feels like oh am i even that good at voice work oh no i've let everyone down um but yeah that's that's happened a few times it's more just funny than anything because i think they kind of get as well that you know they put you on the spot I guess uh, related to that too, because you you kind of brought it up. I I know like some like kind of uh, I don't know if I'd say like controversy, but like point of discussion oftentimes is when you get like these larger uh, Hollywood productions and for their voice casting, oftentimes instead of getting like trade voice actors, they get like um, you know just celebrity voices as a means of like selling yeah. the product. And uh, so I I guess you know what is your take? On that do you think it's a good practice bad practice what's your spin on it 
I think, right, an important thing to remember is that a lot of these celebrities are actors. Like, they, they are professionally trained. That is, you know, a valid point. But uh, at the same time, they are not, like, professional voice actors. They are not professional voiceover artists. And while, you know, a lot of the productions that do utilize celebrity voices are fantastic. Like, you know, you think your original, like, Shrek movie, that is just, like, a complete, like, celebrity cast. Um, but then, you know... I also think about like a lot of other things like um, productions that are like indie animation or smaller mo animation animated movies and they don't use like celebrity voices to push the agenda. I do think there is sort of a thing about it where there was a really heavy push in advertising and there still is to an extent of like animated movies especially where you know in the trailers they will be like oh Zendaya is this person and uh, Chris Evans is this person and it's like they really push like the celebrity is the is the talking point of that as opposed to the actual movie itself and the animation and the story in it um, it pushes the fact that wow this famous person is voicing a one-off character who makes a fart joke that's the big thing that's the big takeaway we want you to remember and I understand how a lot of people will find that irksome and annoying uh, especially in some maybe like ma really mainstream movies like thinking like Angry Birds or Emoji Movie or whatever um, but it's important to remember that like a lot of actual like other animated movies, I, you know, you think all your Studio Ghibli movies, most of them have like really big celebrity voice casts like the Cat Returns has Anne Hathaway and um, uh, the guy from Princess Bride and Tim Curry. Like those are big celebrity voice actors, big celebrity actors, but they do an amazing job in those roles that they're given. Um, but I do think it is. There's a line of it, I guess, you know, where if you do have an, a movie that's really pushing, it's like, oh, wow, Nicki Minaj voices this character. It's like, all right, she's not a character. Well, she's not a voice actor. She's a singer, sure. But like, uh, wh why? Why? What? And <laughs> I can see how people find that annoying. But I think it's also important to remember that, like, it, it shouldn't be like a, a hair trigger response. If you see like, oh, well, they would get this big celebrity to voice this character. It's like, OK, but no, but that, they're an actual actor. Like, they're like a professional actor, like Patrick Stewart or, you know, someone like that like they've been in the industry for a long time they are an actor you know they they, they do these things um so i i, I that, that's my point i understand how people can be annoyed with like oh you're not using like a professional actor i remember there was like some controversy about it with like the mario movie where they had uh, uh chris pratt voicing mario and it was just like why what what he already has an actor i get you want to like legitimize it for like the the movie but it feels like a disservice to the person who's been voicing him for 20 20 odd years that you would throw him aside because we can get a big name to voice him you know um but you know oh he got a cameo ooh, so that that makes up for it but yeah it, it does feel like you know maybe professionals are being thrown aside because they can get a bigger cast i think it also happened with um has been hotel wherein they did have a you know voice cast on the pilot and the online series and then when it was brought over to like amazon prime it was like oh well we can get big voice actors now we can get um Oh God, just I'm really bad with names. Sorry, <laughs> we get all these big actors to play all these roles, and it's like to an extent, like okay, that is cool. They do very good on that job, but also it is just kind of a little bit not disrespectful as such, but just a bit of a kick in the teeth to the actors who helped you get this off the ground. Um, and I think another, oh, I was going to say another example, but I've completely lost it. Um, but yeah, so so it's it's kind of back and forth. It's it's it depends on the situation. Who would you say is the best, like, then, like, celebrity um, actor that has done both, that you think has done a good job at just both, you know, acting, voice acting, as well as acting, you know, like, you, you know, I don't want to say live action is, uh, maybe that's the term, live action voice acting, sure. Uh, like, yeah, state, I was going to say stage, but it's not stage, it's just, it's just yeah, like, regular stage. acting, I guess. Screen um, acting, there you go, whatever. So it's, it's, it's difficult because, like, there is a sort of, like, spectrum of actors who do more voice work compared to more you know live action work uh, and people who are in between um I, I touched on patrick stewart briefly i think he's a fantastic like live actor but i don't think he's a very particularly good voice actor he, he's i don't know he, he's not really got i don't think he's got a very good voice for voice acting if, if that makes sense but he's very good at what he does on like live uh things but um i don't know in terms of like an actor that i can think of that is really good on you know in live action roles and also like voicing roles uh it, it, it's hard to think of one really <laughs> that, that really sticks out i guess um 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't really think of any off the top of my head. Um, it's it's just people who are either actors who could also do voice work or voice actors who maybe have done stints of uh, live work as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's no, I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, fair no. I was just I was just curious if you had a name in mind. Um, a little bit, but you know, before we start this interview, uh, you mentioned that you know, you're going to do a streaming event tomorrow. And I guess I figured, you know, for the sake of, I guess, my audience, if they're interested in you and your work, uh, go ahead and plug yourself. Like, what, what are you doing tomorrow? What's the what's the big event tomorrow? Uh, it's, not, it's not a really big event as such. It's, it's just um, massive. A, it's, it's an enormous event. It's <laughs> cataclysmic. Um, Twitch itself is advertising it on the front page. Every other streamer <laughs> is going to be hosting us. Um, <laughs> No, it's uh, me and uh, another streamer called Sour Plum Wine. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, another like illustrator, animator type, uh, cool person. Uh, I met her through uh, another act, animator called Gadworks, um, who is also a cool animator guy. He worked on The Patrick Show, um, or he still works on The Patrick Show, and he's done boards on other, other cool shows. Um, but yeah, he, her and I, um, we, we hit it off when we were chatting in one of Gad's streams uh, about fighting games. Um, and so we're going to be playing the Capcom, excuse me, Capcom Fighting Collection tomorrow. Um, and because I, I have never played any of these games, I'm expecting her to kind of show me the ropes and uh, teach me some of the basics, and then, you know, we'll have some fun there. Uh, we might play some uh, Ultimate Marvel versus Capcom 3 as well, depending on how the Capcom, um, the Fighting Collection goes. Uh, but yeah, uh, so that, that's going to be us from uh, 3 p.m. British time and then uh, 7 a.m. California time. Uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it because uh, she seems lovely. She's got a really cute uh, sort of like persona design. Um, uh, and I'm excited to talk fighting games with someone. Uh, and most other days, I'm doing streams on Sundays. We are doing a massive playthrough of Ace Attorney, where it's sort of a big voice acting uh, thing that we're all doing. Uh, at the moment, we're towards the end of the first game, uh, during the, the the big sort of like penultimate case. Uh, I'm mostly voicing uh, Miles Edgeworth and Manfred von Karma in that uh, particular case, um, which is a lot of fun because we, we've, we've made like these ridiculous jokes about Manfred von Karma about he is also a Twitch streamer and he is somehow the most inclusive and like thoughtful person in the whole series and um, he's so inclusive that he's married every gender and you know um, that he's just like this really stand up guy um, off screen but yeah and then also on um, Fridays usually I'm playing Stardew Valley with my uh, VTuber sibling uh, Nap Kinner and um, I've gotten really into Stardew Valley from just that because um, I was initially playing it and kind of getting used to it and be like, this is interesting. I don't really know if this is for me. And now while I'm working, like during the week, I'll have Stardew Valley on in the background on my laptop, just like, yes, yes, of course I can. I can look at your private customer details. Hold on. Let me just, ah, oh, I've got to cast this fish. Oh, there's a radish spawned or whatever. So I'm, I'm getting into that. Uh, but then also on Tuesdays, usually I'm playing uh, a game called The Hayseed Night, which was created by Maxi Molina, who is an individ who is a, a sort of um, a game developer and artist and animator and illustrator that he, he does amazing stuff. And it's really fun to play that game um, because it has so many sort of independent voice actors in it. It's a fully voiced sort of visual novel. And um, when I've been like sharing around that I am playing it, I've had several people say, yo, I'm in that game. I'm like, heck yeah, tell me who you are and I'll point you out when I see you. Um, so that that's been really exciting to play, but yeah, most of the time if I'm not playing those specific things, I'm I'm playing fighting games or um, uh, mostly mostly fighting games or like classic PS2 games. Well, we all definitely look forward to uh, enjoying more of your content. You have been a delight to have on this show. We are approaching the hour mark, though, so um, I think you for the most part shouted yourself out. I don't know if there was any socials that you missed. I don't know if you mentioned your uh, YouTube channel or anything like that. But if you know you'd want to just go ahead and shout yourself out where people can find yeah, you, sure. where people um, can find your work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, my YouTube channel is it, so it used to be a lot more diverse. I used to do like flash game reviews or like I, I had a series called courtroom reviews where it was a very Ace Attorney style like review of a game where I'd collaborate with other animators and stuff. Um, but since I've, 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 I've unlisted them, you can still technically find them, but they're not going to be on like the video page. Um, if you go to the playlist, you'll be able to find that old stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, YouTube uh, is mostly like showcasing voice work or comic dubs. Um, 
I'm trying to like make more stuff at the moment I'm working on a, a compilation of um, some dubs that um, are comics from my friend Katie Knit she she also worked on like Spongebob and stuff she's a fantastic illustrator um, but she does this um, web comic series called Riveting Tales which is just kind of nonsense and I really loved it so I thought I would dub a few of the comics from that um, so that should be coming out over the next um, week or so uh, I also have an Instagram where I'm, I post the same thing you know just like dubs and voice stuff some shorts and, and maybe clips from like Twitch um, uh, Twitter you know I post there every now and then and there's Blue Sky there's too many socials <laughs> and um, I obviously have like my uh, website which is like my portfolio I guess uh, showing, showing my demo reel and some testimonials and an easy way to get in touch with me if you would like to contact me for any professional voice acting inquiries um, but that's that's basically all, all that I have to currently offer oh and obviously my Twitch uh, where I stream uh, at least three times a week and um, try and make people feel as included as possible if there, there are new people joining all right and thank you all so much for joining us on podcast pasta don't forget if you're listening to this in eastern europe that um listening to the show might be tax deductible but before you do anything go ahead and talk to your accountant before you mess with any of that stuff uh take care